Leadership Summit. And usually it's primarily training, and then we have a meal, and then I say a few words as well. But tonight is a little bit different in the sense that we have um, not only our Sunday morning Bible study leadership, but I've invited a few other people. And so um, if I can remember who all those are, but that is our trustees, our deacons, our personnel team, our finance team, and I think that's everybody. Oh, and our, and, uh, and our ministerial staff. And so um, I believe that's everybody. And so this is the core of Trinity. This is the, what I call the core leadership. Uh-oh, you lost me. Okay. This is what we call the core leadership. And by the way, <clears throat> I've got something wrong with my hearing. Uh, you know the sound that when your cell phone is on silence and it goes... Zzz, zzz, zzz. Every time I talk, that's what comes in my right ear over here. Zzz, zzz. So if I'm, uh, you know, if you go, hear me, do that, that's, that's, that's what's the problem. Anyway, like our core leadership. And so tonight... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be sharing with you uh, some things that I would say are really for leaders, for leaders only. And so as, as we know, we have people who attend our church. We have from the extreme, on the extremes, we have the person who says, uh, it's all about me. What's this church got to me, offer me and my family? Uh, and how's this church going to minister to me? To on the other extreme where the person says, um, it's all about Jesus, all about God, my relationship with God, and how can I help serve this church and make a difference in the kingdom of God? And that's where hopefully you guys are, more on this side, okay? And so, anyway, so that is our core leadership. And let me go ahead and address something that um, uh, came up this morning, and that is uh, Leo... And so we're just going to go ahead and talk about that because people go, isn't it going to be awkward? Where's Leo? Where's Leo? There's Leo right there. Um, Leo, when I was talking to Leo about tonight, he said, uh, listen, um, uh, you know, you have a tendency to be elongated. You know what? I'm, elongated means talk too much. Leo, I just want to tell you, that was the longest resignation statement that I have ever heard. I was like, all right, shut it down, go on, move on, and, uh, but um, anyway, I just wanted to get you back on that, so. Leo is my friend, and we hate to see him go, but uh, we trust that God is continuing to move in his life, in the life of Trinity Baptist Church, and so, um, anyway, as we keep that going on. Uh, if you will, turn your attention to the screen, and there's a scripture that is going to be popping up there. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. It says, Now we ask you, brothers, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to regard them very highly in love because of their work, and be at peace among yourselves. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Tonight, if you are, we want to recognize some people. Tonight, if you are, uh, if the, we're talking about right now, we're talking about the 9.30, the 9.30 time slot, what is our Sunday morning Bible study, if you are serving in the uh, uh, birth through fifth grade, would you stand and remain standing? These are our shepherd leaders for this group. Shepherd leaders are, hang on, keep standing. Don't, don't sit down. Everybody's going to be standing by the, by the time we're done, okay? These guys are our shepherd leaders. These are the ones who have committed to, to, to invest in the lives of children. And I just want to say thank you so very much. And um, our children and the ministry of the children is so, so very important. Such a high priority. All right, now and I'm going to switch to the 1045. If you are what is called, what we are calling a rotational worker in that same age division, okay, would you stand? Okay, these are guys who come in at the 1045 hour, which is our worship hour, and they are on a rotational basis, some of them once a month. We're trying to go to once every eight weeks, but we need about 150 people more to make that happen. Okay, so just... 
keep that in mind. All right, if you serve in our Sunday morning Bible study, the 930 hour, from 6 through what we call college, would you stand? All right, these are our student ministry folks. If you are in the adult ministries and you are serving in any capacity within our adult ministries, would you stand? If you are a trustee, would you stand? A lot of people serve double. If you are a deacon, would you stand? If you're on the personnel team, would you stand? If you're on the finance team, would you stand? Let's see, did we leave anybody out? Except for their staff. All right. If, yeah, we have a few greeters here. They snuck in. All right, if you are anybody else other than our ministerial staff, go ahead and stand. All right, this is what I want you to do. Look at the person in front of you, behind you, somewhere behind you, say, man, you're doing such a great job. Thank you for being part of the leadership team. All right, you can sit down. I'm going to ask our ministerial staff if they'll come up here. And uh, if you'll come up here and just kind of line up here to my right. These are the people, guys, this is uh, the guys that are around the table in our staff meetings in the parlor on Monday mornings. Yes, spouse too. I'm sorry. Yes, you and your spouse. Uh, your spouse is over here, that lady right there in the red. I'm glad. I said my right, but these people on my left, they're more liberal. This is a conservative group. Okay. About a month ago, I was at a Discovery Trinity class, and uh, this fellow came up to me, and he said, uh, uh, he said, man, I'm, I'm glad to get to know you. So I've, I've seen you around. I haven't got to know you. And, and I, I just want to say how much we appreciate you. And I was thinking, well, sure, you know me. But the truth is that, you know, there, we are such a large church that there are people, uh, our staff, that you just really don't know. And so I want to introduce you to them tonight and make sure I know everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Karen. Oh, come up here, baby doll. Oh, yeah, I was to say. <laughs> that was close. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is Caitlin. And Adam Brock, and um, Adam, as we know, is a teaching pastor over in the North Venue. This is Sasha Rodriguez, and her husband couldn't be here tonight, but Sasha is uh, our children's coordinator, a new position uh, that we started uh, about, I don't know, six or eight months ago. This is Jenny, and this is J.D. Broussard, and J.D. is the worship leader in the North Venue. Where do, uh, don't forget about you. You're still on a bus, okay? Uh -huh. <clears throat> this is uh, Lauren Welburn. She is somebody who's asking me tonight. So who's taking over the Trinity Center? This lady right here is taking over the Trinity Center. Has done a fantastic job, and uh, her and she's got a whole full staff that helps her. But she's our director of the Trinity Center. This is um, <clears throat> <laughs> David Doyle. David Doyle plays on uh, several different roles here. He's our student pastor, also our evangelism pastor. And uh, he does uh, a great job with this kind of uh, coming out of COVID and, and everything that we've been through. David really focused on evangelism and kind of helped us uh, refocus on that. And so uh, through his ministry and through his, his efforts, we've been able to really focus in evangelism and uh, kind of increase that number. And so we appreciate that very much for you. And, 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 and this is his wife, Catherine. Catherine uh, is from uh, Trinity. Uh, they got married here, at Trinity, at what ten years ago, or almost eleven years ago, over in, and they went off for a while, and then they came back to be a part of our staff. This is uh, <coughs> Greg Bath, thank you, and his <laughs> wife Deidre, and Greg is our uh, executive pastor of administration, 
and he oversees several different areas. He keeps us in line on money, mainly keeps the, he says no a lot, and, uh, you know, we can't spend that. But we do appreciate that because he keeps us in line and not spending too much in, with that. So big job and a lot of responsibility that he's got. This is Kevin Richard. Kevin is um, <coughs> our um, counselor. He is uh, the director of our Trinity Counseling uh, Ministry, and we I think we established that in 2016, somewhere around 15. there. 15, 2015. And so he is the guy when you feel like you need a little uh, pep talk and stuff like that or you're just not doing real good mentally, well, then you, you want to set an appointment with him. His wife couldn't be here tonight, and so um, anyway, uh, good guy. Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> All right. And uh, this is Keith Langley and his wife, Amy. And uh, Keith uh, came on board. His first week was the, um, the week, first week of Laura, right? And uh, and so uh, he was tested to the fire in the first week of law, and he is our um, he takes care of a lot of our operations, facilities management, different things like that. If your air conditioning is too hot or too cold, this is the guy. Don't come to me. This is the guy. <laughs> but no, we appreciate him. He's a really good team player. This is Mitch Bohan and his wife Noel. Mitch um, and uh, Mitch is the guy who runs all of our media and stuff, turns the lights on, both the venues that we have and stuff. And so uh, he is uh, with us and doing a great job. Team player, we greatly appreciate it. And um, <coughs> you are both dressed in black tonight, kind of match. That's good. <laughs> so anyway, express your appreciation for them, please. Yeah. Uh, don't go yeah, anywhere. Um, Leo, I forgot to ask you, is there a handheld mic that we can get? Now, is Donna here? Probably not. No. Okay. This is Leo Day. I know you think, well, he doesn't need any introduction, but this is Leo Day. He uh, <coughs> is the uh, Central Venue Worship Pastor, uh, and uh, he has done a great job, and he is one of my, uh, one of my friends, and so uh, we are going to uh, miss him, and we hate to see him go. But um, as he explained earlier, that um, God's called him elsewhere. I've asked Dick Landry to come up here and pray for our staff. And so, Dick, would you come right now and just uh, pray for our staff um, as we go through this time of transition? <laughs> this is my wife, Karen. Thank you, Dick. Guys, you can be seated.
All right. So I've given the title from tonight, From Here. From here, where do we go? How do we handle this? I've been in ministry for uh, 47 years. First church I served in, I was 17 years old as a youth pastor. And, and so uh, I've been here at, at these times of transitions. And, um, and so while it is a time to be concerned, I can tell you there is life after transition. And, so, and it is a good life after transition. But from here, where do we go and how do we handle this? We're going to be talking about, uh, in our scripture in 1 Corinthians. So if you have your Bible, if you have your phone, by the way, if you have your phone, please turn off notifications, turn on vibrate and everything. I really don't want any uh, disturbances tonight because we're going to move into a time of teaching and time of worship, time of prayer. And so uh, just really want us to focus here as a group of leaders, okay? And so let's begin our journey this evening. Let's say that you start out on a trip. You've got a destination in mind. And so you go down a road. Now, you've never been down this road before. But it's a dark road. As you're going down the road, you notice that on both sides there's trees and kind of a, the trees kind of droop over the road and they kind of meet in the middle and it's almost like a canopy that you're going down. The road has got some curves. It's got some straightaways. And so you're going down this road and then in the distance you see a yellow light that is blinking. Now you've got a decision to make. You can observe the caution light, or you can keep going straight ahead, blow right past the caution light. Now, if you're smart, you're going to take, you're going to slow down a little bit. You're going to approach that caution light slowly because you really don't know what's on the other side of the road. That that caution light is there for a purpose. And so tonight, what I want to share with you, things from my heart, five cautions for Trinity Baptist Church as we move through a season of transition. Leo?
So tonight there will be a time of teaching and then there will be a time of music, time of teaching, time of music, and also some times of prayer. You know, worship is so much more than just music. It's interesting that in today's culture, in American culture, we have identified this music as culture, I mean as worship, but it's so much more than that. Um... Trinity has been blessed to be a multifaceted church. We have got a lot of good things going on. We have things uh, as yesterday uh, we began and kicked off what was called our upward season. Trin uh, Lauren, where are you? Lauren Welburn and her team and uh, a bunch of coaches do that. We probably had about 1,000 to 1,500 people on campus from 8 in the morning till late in the afternoon. I came up here between the hours of 10 and 11. I looked around, and I promise you that there was very few people I knew. That's a good thing. We have a lot of things. We have the counseling center. We have Trinity Kids Preschool. We have two venues to worship in. Those are strengths. Those are great strengths for Trinity Baptist Church. They really are. But in a lot, a lot of places and a lot of things, your greatest strength can, can become your greatest weakness if you're not careful. Let me illustrate that for you. A pro athlete. He's good. I mean, I mean he's good. He's, he's great. Matter of fact, he's so good, he doesn't even need to practice. And so he becomes a little bit arrogant, a little bit cocky about how good he is. And then all of a sudden, he gets beat. Their team gets beat. So what happened? Well, you know, I, didn't, I just thought I was better than that, and we, we didn't practice. And so tonight, that's what I want to do is say, as good as Trinity Baptist Church is, we are leaders, and this is leaders, okay? So it's kind of a little bit different perspective and share with you some of my heart, some things that we have to do. We have to watch out for leaders because a general congregation can become out of hand, so to speak, or they can be um, <coughs> cantankerous sometimes, stuff like that. But we are more, we are more mature than that. And so uh, I want to... That's where we want to go tonight is, is recognizing that we do have some strength, but our diversity can also become a weakness. 
And so we're in 1 Corinthians, and if you have your Bible and you want to go ahead and turn there, like I said, or your phone or whatever, the, the verses are going to be on the uh, screens. But we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. It says, the Apostle Paul says, Now I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all say the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be united with the same understanding and the same convictions. For it's been reported to me, this Paul says, to you, my brothers, he's writing to the Christians in the Corinth church, it's been reported to me by members of Chloe's household that there are quarrels among you, and what I'm saying is this, each of you says, I'm with Paul, or I'm with Apollos, or I'm with Cephas, or I'm with Christ. Is Christ divided? Was it Paul who was crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? As you begin to get into the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll see that actually the whole book is, uh, is, is about the, the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was... a uh, 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 obviously, it was a young church. Paul went there, stayed about a year and a half, maybe two years, established the church, and uh, you know, preached and, and new converts and stuff. And then he left to to move forward. And so, and then <coughs> uh, apparently, there's somebody named Chloe that got wind that there's something, some things going on in the church. Now, let me be real careful to say this. I'm giving cautions. I'm not giving warnings. Okay. So these are just things that, as leaders, we need to look at, look for, or be at sensitive to. Okay. So I want to focus on two words in this in, ver, in uh, verse ten. The, the words can be translated in different uh, in different ways in different translations. But he says, Paul says, I want you to be with the same understanding and the same convictions. Two words, same understandings and same conviction. When he talks about understandings, what he's talking about is just the same way of thinking. Just be together in kind of the same way of thinking. Now we know as a church and as a, in our humanity, we all have opinions. We all have uh, things that we want to express. And we feel like that our opinions is, of course, the, the right way, right? There's another word there. He says, and that, and be of the same conviction. And uh, that can also be translated as the same judgment or the same decisions. And so he says, I, I, I'm just, I, I want to encourage you, the Corinthian church here, guys, that you really need to be able to kind of be thinking the same way and you be thinking the, uh, having kind of reached to the same conclusions. Now, that sounds real nice and real pretty and real spiritual. But the truth is, is that it is kind of hard to do because we do have opinions. And sometimes in things like this, we make, we are, we hear things, misinformation, we hear gossip, we hear half-truths, and we have sometimes just downright lies and sometimes just downright gossip. And we cannot tolerate that. That is not acceptable for the body of Christ and as leaders. So if you, if, as you begin to look at it, the reality is there's only three types of issues. There is the issue that is the, uh, it really doesn't matter type of issue. And then there is the negotiable issue, and then there is the non-negotiable issue. Okay? And so <clears throat> when we... Did you follow me? So you have your real doesn't, type, your real doesn't matter type of issues. You have the negotiable type of issues, and you have the non-negotiable issues. The problem with the church is, is that you try to make personal, me, we try to make our personal preferences the non-negotiables. Does that make sense to you? And that's where the rub comes. Because you think you're right. Absolutely it's right. Maybe, maybe not. Let me, get, let me illustrate this for you. When we're... Uh, I was a staff liaison for the design and construction of this building. When we were putting together here, a decision came, had to be made. Are we going to put in pews or are we going to put into chairs? Man, you would have thought, oh my good, I, I thought it was a pretty simple decision. I, there were people, and probably still are, but that are very biased towards pews. 
So much so that they expressed themselves very adamantly and publicly and began to gather people to say the same thing. And so what do you do with that? Oh my goodness, there's divisions in the church over where we're going to sit. So I'm like, well, I don't know, you know. I mean, I'm, this is a God, honest truth. Coming and crying to me saying, it's just not church if we don't have pews. Now, I, I don't want to be insensitive to that, but I'm like, we're really bigger than that. So what do I do? So I started doing a little investigation. Did you know even today that most Eastern religions, they don't even have places to sit, you stand. Did you know that pews didn't even come into the America until about the 1600s? You would have thought that Jesus, the carpenter, would have made the first pew, but he didn't. <laughs> See, even that right now could be a sensitive issue. So I started looking into it a little bit further. So when these, these people came up to me, I said, you know what? I've been reading and looking. Did you know? You know Charles Stanley? Oh, yeah, I know him. I know him. Did you know Charles Stanley doesn't have church on Sunday mornings? He doesn't? I said, no, he doesn't have pews. He's got chairs in his auditorium. No. You know Ed, Ed Young Sr. at Second Baptist? Yeah. He doesn't have chair, a pews either. He's got chairs. I know. David Jeremiah. Did you know that David Jeremiah, he didn't? You see how that works? We want to make our personal preferences the non-negotiables. Let me tell you something else. Let me touch on a real sensitive issue. The type of music that we have at Trinity Baptist Church. We have two venues. We have two great venues. We have two great teams who do wonderful jobs. But do not let that become a divisive place. I'm going to tell you straight up. If you let your personal worship depend upon seven notes of the musical scale and the right rhythm and the right beat determine how you worship, then you are acting in your fleshly nature. Straight up. I can worship a lot of different ways. I do have my personal preferences, but it's, it's okay. We just respect each other. So, as we look at these type of things, and we, um, we just need to understand that there are times when there are going to be some divisions. There are going to be times where there's going to be different opinions and stuff like that. So then the question comes, well, how, how do we reach a conclusion? If all of this is, how do we reach a conclusion? I, I, I'm telling you, there's only one way to do that. And that is total surrender to God. You, we have to get rid of our self. And we have to be led by the Spirit of God. We cannot have any of us, ourself, and our ambitions and what we want to accomplish. We have to be led by the Spirit of God. my worship, this is my offering, in every moment I withhold nothing, I'm learning to trust you, even when I can't see it, and even in suffering, I have to believe. 
want to ask if you would pray with me. Father, we, uh, we come to you as your people. God, oftentimes, most of the time, we are so full of our own ambitions, our own desires, things that we think are the right way, the things that we think are your way. But Father, we're asking for an indwelling of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray for myself. Lord Jesus, that you would fill me with your Spirit, that I would demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, and that, Father, that I, I pray, God, that you would convict me when I get in your way. So, Father, we just lift this time up to you. Father, that's what we're asking as a group of leaders, that you lead us. And we pray this in the name and through the power of Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. Caution number two. Believing our thoughts are spiritual when they may not when they may be from the natural side of our humanity. Paul continues this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, he says, brothers, he's talking to us, to the Christians. I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not ready for it. In fact, you're still not ready, because you are still fleshly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? For whenever someone says, I'm with Paul, another says, I'm with Apollos, are you not unspiritual people? Different translations, when it says unspiritual people, he will also say mere men. For those of you who are students of the word, you know that Paul is actually in the midst of and using some language, very familiar language that he uses quite through most of his letters. And he talks about what we know as the fleshly man or the, un, or the natural man, that is the person who's never accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, the unregenerated mind, that's the natural man. Then you have what's called the carnal Christian or the fleshly Christian, and then you have the spiritual Christian. And so what Paul is saying is that, man, when you start talking like that, he's talking to his church there, is when you start talking like that, you're not, you're not talking like spiritual people. You're talking about, really, you're talking about a carnal, fleshly Christian. You're talking about a fleshly Christian in, in the way that a fleshly Christian would talk. And as a matter of fact, you're even acting like just a downright lost person. Now, you understand that language. But a lost person is motivated, his motivation is for, for self. He has selfish ambitions. He has selfish desires. He is not in control of his will. He has no control of his will. He's not in control of his emotions. He's not in control of anything. It's just all for him. The Apostle Paul, we'll look at a couple of scriptures here, um, <clears throat> goes into a little bit deeper Let's look at Galatians 5, 19. Paul, in, in another book that, that Paul wrote, he begins to describe what it is like or what the characteristics are for a, uh, a, 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 a fleshly person. He says, now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, and sorcery. Now, hopefully we're all okay in those areas. Then he goes on to say hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and then he says, just anything similar. That's kind of a catch-all phrase. Just anything close to that. 
And he says, I'll tell you these things in advance, as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we have to ask ourselves, are we, do we act like a spiritual Christian? This is the truth. I can go, just like you, probably, I don't want to say hopefully, probably, I can turn just like that into a carnal Christian in a heartbeat. Sometimes I, my anger can come up just like that. And so I pray almost every morning. This is my prayer. God, I'm going to be facing situations and people and stuff that's going to maybe anger me. Lord Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to act like a Christian. And sometimes that's hard to do. So what does that mean to act like a Christian? Let's look at the, uh, uh, the next verse. In Galatians 5, 22, 26, it's all in the same passage here. But Paul says, now, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. You've killed it. Your fleshly nature, you've killed that. You've killed it with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, that's where we are, guys. We're trying our best to live by the Spirit. We must not become conceited. we provoking one another or envying one another. Again, how do we do that? We just put our trust. I know, I, I understand it. We're day to day, it's tough, but it's a daily action of putting our trust in Christ, our trust in Jesus.
Let me ask you a question. The song, "Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Do we trust in Jesus? Do we really trust him? Sometimes that's kind of hard to do. I know that. Do you think any of this stuff that we have gone through at Trinity Baptist Church has caught God by surprise? Mitch, I'm keep on doing that. All right, let's go on to the caution number three. Playing favorites while not recognizing the true source of spiritual growth. 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 5 through 9, uh, verses 5 through 9. The Apostle Paul can't, continues this discourse and he talks, says, What then is Apollos and what is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed. He's talking to the church there. They're servants whom you believed. And each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the water is, and who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now the one planting and the one watering are one in purpose. You get that? One in purpose. And each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. Paul was talking to the congregation. There weren't issues with Apollos and Paul. There was issues with the congregation. They were the ones who were esteeming one over the other. In general, we as leaders have got to be what we call the shepherds of the flock, of kind of helping, if, if we see those kind of things, to help guide people in the right way. The other aspect of that is that understanding that we, all of us, have a role to play one man plants, one man waters, but it's God that gives the increase. You think you're something special? You're not. I'm just telling you straight up. One of the biggest challenges in church work is ego. Or should I say pride. Pride is unbridled ego. Pride is when your ego gets out of hand. We all have egos. I got an ego. And we all have egos. But when your ego begins to, I don't know, begins to, to, to rise up and it all becomes about you and how great you are and how, how much Teresa, the joy group, has flourished since you've been a director, Oh, aren't I special? Now, that's not to say that God doesn't use our organization, our talents, our abilities. Teresa and Pete do a great job with that. In John, John, John uh, hits this straight on. In John 2.15, he says there's basically three kinds of sin in this world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Did you hear that last one? The pride of life. That's up there with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And now we got pride in there. Let me tell you, pride will take down Trinity Baptist Church. All of our musicians, all the instrumentalists, our teachers. Oh, look how many people I got this week. Mm -hmm. Boy, we're rocking and rolling, aren't we? Yeah. That's pride. Apostle Paul says here that Basically, he says, you ain't nothing. <laughs> so then neither the one who plants nor the waters is anything. But only God who gives the increase. So 
If it's God that gives the increase, let me just say it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about a man in the pulpit. It's not about a man worship or leading worship or an instrumentalist or the pianist who do such a wonderful job. It's about God. It's about a holy God. Caution number four, as we move through pastoral transitions, trying to make people happy and not holy, and that is making sure that our core ministries of worship and Bible teaching are priority and not events and peripheral ministries. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder. And another has builds on it. 
But each one must be careful how he builds on it, for no one can lay any other foundation that has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. And if anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. What are we building with here at Trinity Baptist Church? I have done more things, more stupid things, <laughs> to try to get people to come to church. Gimmicks. My first church, I dressed up as Captain Sunday School. I wore tights, satin shorts, a sweatshirt, and a cape, and a chrome helmet, an army helmet that I had chromed, and I was Captain Sunday School. I'm trying to get 1,200 in Bible study on that special day. We have things here. We have friend days, we have high tennis days, we have um, um, uh, play days, we have parent nights outs, we have uh, all kinds of different things. We've got uh, the Trinity Center, which in and what of itself has got several different sub-ministries within itself. We have the Great Counseling Center, we have our Mose Day Out program, we have all of these different things. I'm calling those peripheral ministries. Now don't hear me say that I'm against those kind of things. I, I, see, because of the natural man, the natural man, those kind of things appeal to the natural man. And so every once in a while we do some of those things. That's why we do them, because they kind of, they kind of appeal to the natural man. But I had a person tell me one time, he said, man, we would be in bad shape if we didn't have the Trinity Center. I think I knew what he was saying. But what kind of shape would Trinity Baptist be in if we didn't have the peripheral ministries? If we didn't have the Trinity Center, which I visit quite often. I see some of y'all walking around the track. see some of you in the fitness center. see some of you playing basketball. And a few of you trying to play pickleball. It's a great facility, isn't it? Isn't it nice? It is. It's a nice facility. But if you didn't have that, we didn't have our counseling center, and we didn't have uh, our Mother's Day Out program, where would Trinity Baptist Church be? This morning, tonight, you got dressed, you put on some clothes, clothes that make you look better. Does that, fit? Does that make me look heavy? <laughs> right, I walk through that door right there, and there, I think it's that, that door right there, there's a mirror. And I walk, I walk right by there, and I walk like that, and I did a second take, and I said, man, I'm getting fat. <laughs> Woo! Heavy. So we try clothes that make us look a little thinner. Sometimes we, you know, uh, may do some things like, uh, and, uh, you know, special makeup or something, special hair thing. But who are you at your core? When you take all of that away, all the stuff that makes you look good, who are you? Our core ministries is the Bible study ministry and the worship ministry. What should happen? We might have a little impact by not having hopefully as many, I mean, not many as, as people who see that come to the church, but what should happen? There should be no difference. Our core ministries of Bible study and worship should be paramount. All these other ministries are what we call peripheral or, or bridge ministries. 
Those are on the outside. This is the worship. This is the, the Bible study ministry. This is our pillar right here. All these other things around it are just bridges. Bridges to, to a relationship with Christ. But let me tell you, from the guy who oversees a bunch of those things, the bridge is out. We've got to realign ourselves. We've got to realign our ministries. We have some great people who are doing some great jobs and trying to make some things happen over there. But sometimes the bridge is out. As we've come, we have a new pastor. That individual is going to come with a new vision for Trinity Baptist Church. And we need to align our minds, our thoughts, behind that vision. What is the vision?
Heavenly Father, we <clears throat> we just come to you asking for your grace and your mercy as as a corporate body of believers. Father, I, I'm asking, Lord Jesus, that you just give us wisdom to align with your vision, not our vision. Father, we want to find your will. We want to go your way. It is you. Father, I pray for our staff and our leaders in this room. Father, we're asking for grace and mercy, forgiveness, Lord Jesus, when we get ourselves in the way. Caution number five. Not in touch with reality. Being overly self-confident while not using proper judgment. 1 Corinthians 3, 18, 19 says, No one should deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, you must become foolish so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolish, foolishness with God. There are so many different directions you could go with this passage. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But uh, I just want to say, you think you got it figured out? Think again. You think you know how God should act? But your way, I'm sure, huh? Think again. And I will also say this. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. We have teams. We have committees. We have people who have tasks to fill. I can't imagine How many of us have at least thought or actually verbalized how we think the search team should be running? Stay in your lane. Because our wisdom <laughs> is nothing. That's why we should be seeking God. So in conclusion, there's five cautions. Number one, divisions because of misunderstandings and judgments. Number two, believing our thoughts are spiritual when they may be from the natural side of our humanity. Number three, playing with playing favorites while not recognizing the true source of spiritual growth. Trying to make people happy and not holy. I could on all of these I could take another <laughs> easy, another hour. Not in touch with reality is our last one. Being overly self confident while not using proper judgment. In conclusion, I want to say that encourage us to be people of integrity. No manipulation. No hidden agendas. We be honest, open, transparent when we can. God the same guy who just brought all that we talk about in the 14th chapter says, For God is not a, a God of confusion, but of peace. So all of our different teams in different places who have decisions to make, how do you know when you arrived at the right decision? Peace. There's that peace that does pass all understanding. I don't understand it, but there's a peace. There's a calmness. God never has to go back and apologize. His, ag his agenda is truth, pure and simple. 
I want to close with this. I want to ask you if you're a man of integrity. On the screen, you're going to see a house. We're going to talk about E's, E-A-V-E-S. Now, just so that we can all be on the same page. And Eve is that part that's underneath, it's overhang. I know that uh, most of the, the guys in here know what an Eve is. But we're talking about underneath there. And there's a face board. Those are important. When I was 15 years old, I was wanting to make some money. And I'd watch my dad paint. And I'd help him paint. And so I, um, I said, I can paint. So there's an old man in our church, walked with a cane, stooped over just a little bit. I walked by, uh, he, uh, word got out that I painted, and so he asked me to come by and give him a bid on his house, and so I did. Big, big house. An A-frame house, I mean a wood frame house, you know, uh, two-story, and, uh, and man, it hadn't been painted in years. And so I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be a job. So I painted his house, gave him a bid for $325. Spent three weeks doing that, going from 8 to sun, sun up to sundown. With a little 4-inch hand scraper, I scraped his whole house with a little extension ladder. I did that, 15 years old. I put a primer on it, and then I painted it. So the day came when it was payday. So I knocked on the door. His name was Mr. Baylor. Mr. Baylor, I'm done. He walks out on the front porch. He says, are you a man of integrity? Well, I'm 15 years old. I'm not sure if I know what integrity means. I said, uh, I, I knew it was good, so I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, well, let's go find out. So he hobbles down the front porch. This is the front porch. Comes over here, all the way to the end of the house, turns a corner, and he looks up to the eve. He said, I'm going to find out if you're going to paint, if you paint behind the eaves. See, behind the eaves. You, could, you didn't have to paint that because nobody ever sees it. Except for a person who's looking for it. But from the faceboard, from the front of the house, it looks great. But when you look up, I didn't know what he was looking for. Looked up, he said, well, Ricky, you're a man of integrity. You painted behind the eaves. So that's what I want to leave with you. We have one more song. Be people of integrity. Authentic. Genuine. Transparent. We're just people of God. It's okay. We're all on the same team. We're going to close out with a song. I, you know, I just invite you to pray. If you want to come up here at front and pray, you want to uh, stay right there in your pew and pray. If you want to kneel, you want to, whatever you want to do. You say, well, what do I pray about? Just ask God to take control, empty yourself before God and say, God, whatever you want to do with me. Amen. Let's stand together.
Dismissed.